data science and first principles calculations combined with experiments to engineer the elastic strain of, of materials to achieve uh, new uh, properties, uh, physical, chemical uh, properties. And we've all known that uh, high pressure physics uh, can give us amazing properties. For example, if I take a piece of uh, metallic uh, sodium and uh, put it in diamond anvil cell and uh, give it a pressure like uh, 200 gigapascal, then it actually turns uh, optically transparent. Uh, however, uh, what I like to talk today is kind of like a superset of high pressure physics, uh, which only applies uh, equal triaxial compressive stresses. So all the three uh, principal stresses has to be negative and equal. Now, if you, let's say, uh, compress in X and uh, pull in Y, uh, that is uh, shear stress, but uh, you wouldn't be able to go very far in standard materials because uh, uh, you're going to approach the yield strength and trigger uh, dislocation plasticity. Or uh, if you apply just uniaxial tension, uh, you could also trigger a fracture. So you'll be pretty far away from uh, this ideal strength, which was uh, predicted by Franco, uh, which is about 10% uh, elastic strain. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that uh, you can, of course, take a piece of conventional material and bend it uh, 20, 30, 40%. But just remember that basically all plasticity, uh, there is usually less than 0.1% uh, elastic strain uh, in conventional materials. However, as we uh, shrink the characteristic size scale of, let's say, the grain size uh, in these uh, bulk nanocrystalline materials, uh, there is a very well-known mantra called the smaller is stronger, which means that the yield strength, uh, which is resistance against shear, uh, goes up uh, with reducing grain size. So that even for uh, pure copper, uh, by reducing the grain size to tens of nanometers, you can have uh, shear uh, yield strength that's greater than uh, one gigapascal without any uh, solid strengthening. And this is also true for uh, uh, sample size. Uh, so uh, Professor Bill Nix has uh, led this uh, size-dependent uh, plasticity effect. And, and generally, it's true for thin films uh, nanoporous materials, uh, nanowires, that uh, the smaller the size scale, uh, be it grain size or uh, uh, film thickness, uh, the larger tensile shear, this kind of a deviatoric stress uh, the material can sustain. And so I define uh, ultra strength to be, if you have a component, you have a material component, uh, where everywhere in that component, uh, you have more than one tenth of the ideal strength. And since the ideal strength is 10% elastic strain, it means if you have pervasively uh, more than 1% shear or tensile elastic strain in that material component, then it's uh, ultra strength. So uh, here are some experimental uh, data. So for we have carbon nanotubes, uh, nano uh, tubes, uh, nano wires, uh, nanoparticles, nanospheres, and graphene. So uh, on this column uh, is the uh, uh, basically one tenth of the Young's modulus, and on this column is the measured strength. Uh, and we see that you can get a significant fraction or sometimes uh, really approach the theoretical strength. And uh, one extreme example is uh, graphene, which is uh, the thinnest possible in one dimension. Uh, and in 20, uh, uh, 2007, uh, we've calculated the ideal strength uh, is from uh, 110 to 120 gigapascal. Uh, and then a year later, uh, there was a measurement of, of 130 gigapascal. So let's take a look at the calculation. Uh, this is the phonon dispersion curve uh, when there is no strain. And uh, phononically, there is no uh, band gap. So that's your normal graphene. However, when you uh, put it to about 20%, uh, the strength goes to more than 100 gigapascal. But also look at how big uh, the phonon dispersion curve have changed. There is a very wide uh, phononic band gap uh, that's opening up. 
And we know that uh, phonons co controls uh, things like uh, thermal conduction, controls uh, thermal electricity, controls uh, superconductivity. So uh, the idea is that when you strain graphene to this level of strain, uh, where the bonds are really stretched, then this is really not your uh, standard graphene. So uh, in 20, uh, a year later, uh, Professor Jim Hong at Columbia performed this experiment where uh, they put uh, this monolayer graphene on uh, a hole, which is one uh, to 1 1.5 microns, and then use different uh, indenter tips uh, to poke it until it fails. Uh, they found two things. Number one, if they need a nonlinear uh, <coughs> elastic uh, constitutive relation to fit uh, this low displacement curve. Uh, and number two is that right at the point where uh, it fractures, uh, the strain uh, and the stress under the tip is 130 uh, mega, uh, gigapascal. And so we know that right before failure, uh, the graphene there is not your uh, standard graphene. So uh, the reason uh, that uh, you, you have this uh, smaller, stronger behavior is, is, is the following. Is that what you're looking at is the traditional uh, deformation mechanism map, where the vertical axis is the uh, shear stress normalized by the uh, shear modulus. And uh, ideal strength is about uh, 10%. So uh, that's when uh, the atomic bonds, even in a perfect crystal, and even if uh, it's at zero Kelvin, uh, no thermal activation would, would break. So that's the upper bound uh, to strength. Uh, and at low temperature, and, and uh, <coughs> you have this uh, uh, dislocation yield, and, and, and uh, like I said, it's usually uh, less than 0.1, 0.2%. Uh, now, as you go to higher temperature, so this is temperature normalized by the melting temperature, uh, you have a much stronger strain rate uh, sensitivity. So here, the strain rate is anywhere from 10 to the minus 10 per second to 10 to the 12 per second. So this is 12 order of magnitude in a strain rate, and we're looking at the flow stress. And so there are different deformation regimes, for example, here you would have uh, diffusional plasticity, and here you would have a power law creep. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is uh, the traditional deformation mechanism map for coarse-grained uh, nickel. What is really new uh, in the last 30 years is also is we have a lot of nanocrystals, thin films, metallic glass, nanowires, nanotubes, uh, which all manifest strength, which is way beyond uh, the traditional coarse grain materials. Uh, and <laughs> the reason is as you shift the size scale, uh, these uh, deformation mechanism regimes, uh, these maps would shift. And the fundamental reason is uh, in the coarse grain material, the strength is controlled by uh, defect propagation. That is to say, uh, you're always going to have Glissal dislocations or cracks. And the question is, you know, do they move or not? Do they multiply or not? However, when you go to these uh, nano objects, it turns out that it's much more difficult to stabilize uh, these extended defects, like dislocations uh, in uh, these materials. It turns out that it's much more difficult to have a stable frank read source because the pinging points are attracted to the boundaries. And so it turns out that when you need to deform, you very often need to nucleate uh, these defects uh, afresh. And that's what controls uh, the strength. So you really alter the defect population dynamics. <coughs> and, and that uh, changes uh, uh, the dynamic range of, of stress uh, that these nanomaterials can take. And we have a very uh, powerful example uh, in this case, which is, so-called strain silicon technology. And it's in everybody's uh, laptops and cell phones where people uh, epitaxially put uh, pure silicon on this uh, silicon germanium uh, alloy. Uh, and then you can apply uh, about 1% tensile by axial strain on this just like a 10 nanometer wide silicon. And using that, you can improve uh, the electronic carrier mobility by a factor of two. And this is actually one of the uh, most important so-called uh, non-geometric scaling effects. And that's delaying the breakdown of the Moore's law. 
So uh, this is already uh, in commercial scale. But what I want to talk to you today is what so-called deep uh, elastic strain can give you. Uh, to show you what is deep, uh, this is uh, an experiment uh, that uh, in collaboration with Professor Yang Lu at the City University of Hong Kong, who grew these uh, 1106 nanowires. And these are actually pretty big. These are micron lens uh, nanowires. And in the MEMS device, uh, uh, you can strain this silicon wire by more than 10%. And it's completely reversible and elastic until eventually it fractures about 14%. You have these oscillations. Uh, but before that, it's completely reversible. And very recently, uh, in collaboration uh, with Yang Lu Group and, and several other groups, uh, we've managed to strain diamond because diamond is like uh, the Mount Everest of uh, electronic materials. And so we're able to uh, strain uh, actually this diamond micro bridge uh, by about 6%, and it's completely uh, reversible and, and elastic. And not only that, uh, you can uh, multiplex it. So not just one bridge, but here you see uh, nine bridges, which all sustain uh, this huge amount of, of elastic strain. Here is uh, 60 gigapascal. So uh, the idea is in the future, maybe we can have wafer scale multiplexing of, of these bridges. And on every bridge, uh, we can integrate thousands of, of transistors or other devices. So the question is, what can... 5%, 10%, tensor strain or shear strain uh, give to you. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this strain engineering is not a new idea at all. You know, every physicist knows that, of course, if you change uh, the lattice parameter, if you change uh, the, the, the primitive cell angles, then you're going to change uh, everything. And so this is uh, actually well-known called the piezo uh, resistivity. Uh, uh, in the early days. So this is uh, John Bardeen and uh, Shockley. Uh, so these are the, you know, uh, the, the, the godfathers of, of semiconductor industry, and they have uh, already discussed about this problem. However, in, in 1950, uh, what they did is uh, this deformation potential theory. So that is a, a linear response uh, perturbation theory. And people can also use perturbation theories like K.P. Uh, expansion. And so what we can do today with uh, machine learning and data science is to really look at <clears throat> what nonlinear strain can give you uh, uh, in terms of, of, of the band structure. So here, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Shapiv at Skotech and Professor Super Suresh and Ming Dao at uh, uh, NTU, uh, we are developing uh, machine learning to learn uh, from high-powered uh, GW calculations uh, of, of the band structure and band gap. So the reason we do this is uh, generally strain tensor is a three by three matrix. Uh, it have uh, six uh, independent strain components. And then uh, the reciprocal space, K space is three dimensional. So there you've got nine dimensional, and then you also got the band indices. And furthermore, you also have effects, for example, nonlinear optical effects which re relies on string gradients. So that would give you even more indices and, 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 and labels. And so it's impossible to use uh, like a simple tabulation to, uh, to follow this. So what we've done is to use uh, different uh, like random forests or neural network. And we just look at how to develop this kind of a proxy representation of, of the electronic band structure. And just to illustrate, uh, you know, what you can get with strain, uh, here I'm showing you uh, so-called density of band gaps uh, in a strain that's generally uh, strained by these uh, six independent uh, normal and uh, shear strains. So uh, just to orient yourself, uh, the vertical axis is the band gap. So without strain, uh, it's 1.1 electron volt. Uh, now we cannot, it's very difficult to visualize in six dimensions. So what we do in the horizontal axis is to collapse into this scalar parameter uh, called elastic strain energy density. This is in the unit of milli electron volt per angstrom cubed. So uh, the color here, this blue color here is uh, the distribution of band gaps you can get. Because let's say if I allow the material to have 
five MeV per angstrom cubed elastic energy, then there are infinite combinations of these uh, strings, and you're going to get different uh, band gaps. So this color is basically what's the distribution of band gap of silicon. Now you see that it basically range from zero, a metallic silicon, still in the diamond cubic phase, all the way to about 1.2 uh, electron volt. So anywhere in between, you can get, uh, you know, uh, if you put in this much energy. Now, where was the uh, Professor Yang Lu's experiment? Well, it was here. So in that experiment, we've achieved more than uh, 14 or 13 MeV per angstrom cube. Okay, so this shows you how much uh, you can change silicon span structure. And in fact, if we just go a little bit above this uh, experimental point, we get this red island, and this is a uh, direct band gap because we know silicon, you know, have indirect band gap. So if you can have a direct band gap, then you can, you know, make uh, a lot of other, uh, you know, more efficient uh, photovoltaics, for example. So uh, this blue is the indirect band gap distribution. And, and just to show, you know, if you do the second germanium alloy, it is this range, but these are for the infrared detector. So you can basically make silicon uh, have all kinds of band gaps and, and properties. And this red uh, dot is the lower bound on uh, the band gap. So uh, what this is telling you is, you know, if you are trying to find the most efficient way uh, to reduce silicon's band gap, then, then these strains uh, should be the path that you take, okay? So let us look at what that looks like. So here I'm plotting uh, the XX strain, the YY strain, uh, all the way to epsilon, uh, this is epsilon uh, XY. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to show you is that, you know, if you just do perturbation, theory, then, uh, you know, these initial slopes are the initial direction you're going to try to reduce uh, silicon's band gap, if that's what you want to do. However, uh, the first metal that you get here uh, is after it has thrown a curveball, nature thrown a curveball, uh, you have all these uh, nonlinear uh, nonlinear behavior, right? And this is the very first metal uh, you can get. This is the first metallic uh, silicon that you get. So this is beyond traditional K-P perturbation series. Uh, and, and this shows you, you know, uh, one way uh, you can think of, of this machine learning model. The other one is you can analyze uh, topological features uh, in, the, in the band structure. Now, we know that uh, the band gap is the difference between the conduction band minimum and the valence band maximum. Uh, and also the conduction band minimum can have this crossover. It's like a phase transition, right? So uh, what I'm showing you is, you know, in, uh, let's say, just the three normal strains, if you try to make silicon uh, 0.9 electron volt band gap, then this is almost like the yield surface, uh, but it, it is in the strain space, but these are, those strain states which give you 0.9 EV uh, silicon. And what you notice is that it is piecewise continuous, but then there are these uh, ridge lines. So these ridge lines correspond to a crossover in the band structure, and then three ridge lines would meet at a corner. And so we can use uh, the machine learning to help us to classify uh, these topological transitions. Uh, you know, what kind of uh, CBM, the VBM you have, and when can you have uh, indirect to direct bank up transitions? So uh, we've actually have version 2.0 of uh, this uh, machine learning model using uh, convolution neural network. Uh, and this, for example, is result for diamond. And in the case of diamond, uh, the direct island is actually much closer uh, to uh, uh, then, then in the case of silicon, in fact, experimentally, we are already uh, in the foot here. So this just show you, you really can make, uh, let's say, diamond a direct band gap material and uh, uh, with, with, with band gap, you know, approaching that of gallium nitride, for example. And for those who have worked on a uh, new network, let's say, uh, interatomic potentials, we know that a new network uh, can be somewhat noisy, uh, meaning that uh, 
its value may be good, but when you try to take derivative or second order derivative, you may have some numerical issues. Uh, so uh, what we try to challenge the network to do here is to compute the effective mass because this controls the electron mobility. And uh, fortunately, we see that uh, it actually, even for this uh, second derivative, which is the uh, of the frequency uh, with the wave vector, uh, we can get pretty good uh, testing error uh, versus experiments. So this validates that you can use this uh, to do all kinds of uh, band structure characterizations. And just remember that, you know, once we have this machine learning model, uh, we have the band structure, we also have the string energy density. So we basically get the whole nonlinear elastic deformation constitutive relation. So in collaboration with uh, Professor Super Suresh and, and Ming Dao, uh, we can model this kind of bent diamond needle and uh, use uh, this uh, new network uh, on the fly uh, uh, as a constitutive relation to model mechanical deformation. And in fact, you know, it's very rich. You can have the diamond from going from indirect band gap uh, to a direct band gap material, and then you can get uh, to a direct metal, uh, even, even in diamond, uh, without graphitization, still in the SP3 uh, kind of uh, hybridization. And for the first time, we're able to virilize the whole uh, ideal strain surface, because ideal strain surface is a five-dimensional object in the six-dimensional strain space. And it also have these singular features, uh, it's piecewise continuous. Uh, so uh, we're able to uh, learn this. For example, uh, this shows uh, all the CN color is uh, stable. So it's uh, uh, all the phonons have stable uh, real frequency. All the pink color means uh, one of the phonons have lost the stability. So these are the straight, three st uh, normal strains, and uh, uh, these are the three uh, uh, shear strains. So we are able to, for the first time, get a mathematical descriptor of what this uh, ideal strain surface uh, looks like. So uh, this actually inspires us to think about, you know, uh, what we can do uh, with uh, this much data and, and, and string engineering. And just to sort of step back and, and let's think about, you know, what chemical metallurgy, you know, uh, Iron Age, Bronze Age, have done for human civilization, obviously have done a lot. But that's not because, you know, our ancestors uh, knows physical metallurgy or they know quantum mechanics or DFT calculations. Uh, they all actually is based on the fact that the liquid melt, the liquid, you can have a large range of solubility. So if, let's say, if you have too much, let's say, zinc, that the resultant uh, solid is, let's say, have poor hardness, then let's just try to, you know, uh, reduce the thing, right? So generally, uh, there is no symmetry principle that say that the property that you care about reaches maximum uh, at uh, zero strain. So using this principle, uh, we can use a strain and use it as a seven component alloy. It's equivalent to a seven component random solid solution. And so with strain, uh, we think we can do a lot uh, in terms of material property. So this is a talk that uh, Richard Feynman gave at APS banquet dinner in 1959. So he was talking about uh, what uh, miniaturization can do for human civilization. And in particular, he was saying that just beyond the, you know, the geometric scaling, there is this non-geometric scaling effect. He was talking about, you know, this, uh, Friction can be much more important. This is called stiction uh, in the MEMS. And he was also talking about 100 little hands that's pulling the material. So it's very, very mechanical if you just look at the transcript of that uh, talk. Uh, you know. Uh, so you know, what we are, are talking about, this string engineering is a very important non-geometric scaling effect. Uh, you can call it a non-classical effect because the smaller you get, the bigger the parameter space in strain space, so the room here, there's plenty of room, we take it to mean the parametric space of elastic strain, the shear and pencil strains that you can play with to change the fundamental physical and chemical properties and optical properties. So generally, like I said, anything that you care, uh, I care, optical properties, ionic properties, 
even you know chemical catalytic properties there is no symmetry principle that say that you know at zero pressure zero strain that is optimized no uh, so that means that generally you know if going in a certain direction is bad then just go in the reverse direction you can improve uh, your figure of merit however uh, there are practical difficulties so before uh, 1986 before the invention of the atomic force microscopy which I consider to be sort of the, the dawn of, of nanotechnology, you've got a lot of high pressure physics uh, in the diamond anvil cell. You also have a lot of physical metallurgy, right? So people do apply a little bit of shear and a little bit of tension, uh, but you don't go very far uh, except uh, in, this, uh, in this direction. However, after 1986, there is a big explosion of materials and devices where you can apply huge stress and you can hold it there at room temperature for a few months and it does not relax uh, from that metastable state. So you can keep it there, you can hold it there, just like a strain uh, silicon in your, uh, in your laptop. So I like to give a few uh, examples. Uh, you know, uh, initially uh, some uh, have to do with, with electrons and photons, but then I also give an example on superconductivity and then eventually on topological materials. So people know that this uh, two-dimensional multidisulfide uh, can sustain a very large tensor elastic strain, so more than 10% uh, indefinitely in the lab. And so we were thinking, you know, what you can do uh, with, with this. So imagine uh, if you have a triangle uh, of multidisulfide, uh, and you're just uh, pulling in the middle. So the total tensile force uh, is a constant as you go towards the center, which you call origin. So it's a, it's a constant of R, but because the uh, distance is reducing uh, as, as R, so the stress goes as one over R, and so the strain goes as one over R, and so your conduction band uh, your CBM and your VBM would also vary as one over R. So therefore for carriers, that's like an artificial hydrogen atom, except that number one is 2D and number two is much bigger, of course, than the real atom. This is uh, an order of micron uh, size. And you can have three situations. Uh, you can have the uh, CBM goes down uh, like this and VBM rise up like that. That's one over R. So in that case, you can absorb a photon here. Uh, you can create an electron hole. The hole and the electron, they both would drift to the center and be separated there. Or you can have the electron uh, drifting to the center and then the hole goes to the rim. Uh, so you can you know, harvest different color of light uh, that way. Or you can have a strong electron hole binding and then the hole drags the so the electron drags the hole to the origin uh, and uh, you can separate both the electron hole as a neutral exciton. So this would move as a neutral charge, neutral exciton and be separated at the, the origin. So the benefit of, of this drifting motion is it can be much more efficient in collecting the exciton than traditional photovoltaics, which the exciton have to move just by random walk and has to reach a building field within tens of nanometers. This actually allows you a much bigger range up to micron uh, of this energy harvesting region. And then uh, you only need to separate a charge in this artificial atom nucleus. So we, this is the uh, calculation result. So we've have done the GW calculation. And on top of that, we also done the beta salt peter equation calculation. And the band structure really changes uh, when you go from 0% to 9%. And this is the optical absorption uh, spectrum. So without strain, it's about 1.9 electron volt. Uh, with strain, it becomes 1.1 electron volt. And then this is the band alignment uh, with strain. And it's either type two or type three uh, solar energy funnel. So this is how it looks like. Now this one over R singularity will be uh, normalized at the center uh, by the finite radius of curvature of the indenter. So it's not really going to diverge. Uh, so we can have this kind of energy landscape for electrons and holes. And you just need to put 
and electron accepting semiconductor and hole accepting semiconductor, and, and you can do this artificial atom. So a very important uh, problem is, you know, what is the wave function of this uh, exciton? Is it a, a big exciton or is it a small exciton? So by the beta saw peter equation, we show that the exciton wave function is quite large. It's uh, about four nanometer in diameter. Uh, so I'm showing the whole wave function when you hold the electron fix because this is a six dimensional uh, wave function. So it is quite big. Uh, but because it's 2D, uh, unlike in 3D where you have very good dielectric screening, uh, the di dielectric attraction is pretty big. And so the binding energy is 0.5 electron volt. So we think it's a type three solar energy funnel where you can move the charged neutral exciton by up to a micron distance. So that was a prediction in 2012. And a year later, this was kind of verified. So uh, there was an experiment uh, from a case Western where uh, people put a monolayer molydisulfide on PMMA and just bend the substrate and you create a tension on the top surface, still uniform tension. Uh, it's not a very big strain, it's only 0.5%. Uh, and But you can already see a visible change uh, in the absorption spectrum and in the photoluminescence spectrum. And they've got about 70 MeV per 1% of strain, we predicted about 100 MeV per 1% of strain. And then also there was a demonstration of uh, not just uniform strain, but uh, if you have a strain gradient. So in this case, uh, this is result from the Netherlands where you have what we call replocation. So you have this position dependent bending curvature and that curvature strain can change the band gap so they show that uh, you know they can absorb photon at the valley of the replication, but then this can drift hundreds of nanometers to the crest uh, of the replication and then re-emit as a, a red shifted light. And so they cited our paper they, 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 and it verified you can indeed have this pretty long range transport of, of energy carrier, which is a charge neutral exon in this 2D material like we predicted. And also you can change the dielectric properties. You can also see uh, changing the electron energy loss spectrum. So this is, uh, uh, you know, validated. Uh, but that was sort of uh, 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 a paradigm where you, you're sending the photons and you're looking at the charge carriers. What about the other way? Uh, so, uh, you know, what about you send the electrons and you collect the photon that comes out? So, uh, after uh, uh, my, my previous postdoc, Ji Feng, went back to Peking University, uh, we uh, immediately collaborated with Professor Rida Peng and, and Feng Jian. We did this experiment. So uh, uh, this is a Cassidy luminescence. So this is done in a scanning electron microscope where uh, they made a zinc oxide uh, microwire. So it's not even a, a nanowire. The, the wire is like uh, four microns uh, in, in diameter. And then when it's just using the SEM electron beam to cut across in four different locations, one, two, three, four. And uh, when you scan the, and there is, a, there is a photon detector in the SEM that's just collecting the color of the light. When, when you scan in the location one, uh, because there is no bending moment, so uh, all the color of the light that come out is, is the same, it's monochromatic. Doesn't matter where you cut. But when you cut across uh, regions when there, where there is a bending curvature, they see that on the tensile side, on all side, it comes out as this monochromatic red light. But then as they cut across the wire to the inside, uh, you have a much broadened spectrum, but then there is also a blue shift. And it depends on where you cut it. So uh, we, we model this, we fit the, uh, the curvature of, of this wire, uh, you know, uh, we did the FT calculations and then uh, we write down this uh, uh, mesoscale transport equation where this N is the concentration of charged neutral excitons. This is not the uh, free electron concentration. This is, a, this is exciton concentration. And then D is the exciton diffusion diffusivity. So this term is the uh, random walk term. And then 
Uh, these two terms are the drift terms. So D divided by KBT uh, is Einstein relation is the external mobility. And then the drift is proportional to the band gap gradient. But the band gap depends on the strain. So this is also proportional to the strain gradient. The strain changes the band gap and that drive drift of charge neutral axons. This G is a delta function that is basically the electron beam we put on the nanowire that excites uh, the electrons. And then this N over tau is the light that you see. Uh, this is the single relaxation time approximation. The charge neutral exon can do a radiative recombination and you can see the light that comes out with, with the color there. So uh, we're putting the reasonable numbers, uh, parameters, and we can really fit uh, the observed uh, photon spectrum. So uh, this is the case when the electron beam is put on the tensile side of the bent wire. And on the tensile side, uh, the band gap is already minimum here. So it's very similar to like if you have a kitchen sink and you're just aiming the water jet from your faucet at the, the, the rim of the, uh, sorry, at the center of the kitchen sink. And, and there, you know, it's already, energy minimum, so it's not going anywhere, the water. So you're gonna drain, you know, pull up there a bit and then just drain out. And so the color that you see is, is pure red. But as you move your faucet gradually towards the, the side of the kitchen sink, uh, then you're gonna have kind of this kind of steady state water distribution, right? So you're going to have your axons there, but they're all attracted to the center of the sink and then pull up there. So so uh, you, this is your blue light. Uh, you have a higher band gap in the compressive side. Uh, but then uh, on the tensile side, there is also population. So there's still some red light there. So with this, we can explain uh, the spectrum that we see. And in fact, you don't just have to have radio string gradient. You can have uh, uh, longitudinal string gradient as well. So the previous examples are you apply a strain on material uh, to guide the flow of electrons and, and, and photons. And for IT, you don't need a lot of material. And in fact, all the strained silicon in your laptop is like 10 to the 10 kilograms. However, uh, you know, I work on energy and for clean energy, uh, be it uh, superconducting cables, uh, be it photovoltaics or batteries or catalysts, even catalysts, you know, you've got to make kilograms of the stuff, tons of the stuff. Otherwise, you're not going to have any impact. That's the, you know, MIT A plus B, A for action. You've got to actually reach this kind of scale to have impact within 20 years. Uh, so I want to actually show you one example, and this is in collaboration with a Professor uh, Li Shantui at the China Petroleum University. Um, uh, this is one example where you can do string engineering on kilograms uh, scale of materials. So what uh, Li Shan uh, have done is he took uh, this eutectically solidified uh, composite. So you have this uh, nickel titanium shape memory matrix. And then when you cool it down from the melt, you have this micron sized uh, niobium rods with, with very good interface. And then he very carefully uh, performed the wire drawing. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time uh, doing this wire drawing. And then after wire drawing, this micro wire is drawn down to tens of nanometers. So within a millimeter diameter uh, micro wire, there is actually uh, 10 million of, of these nano, now being nanowires. So uh, this is the micro wire, so this is a millimeter wire, you can actually draw kilometers of this stuff in the very first tensile cycle. Now for metal, this loading part is not surprising, okay? That you can strain a metal by uh, 7%. However, for typical metal wire, if you unload, your unloading path will go like this. You would have you know, uh, a plastic strain when you unload to zero stress. But in, in, in his wire, when you unload, uh, it goes back to zero. Okay. And, and you have very high strengths, uh, 1.7 gigapascal and very low modulus. And this is very, this is 
just uh, not happening in, in either polymeric material or metallic materials. You actually do this hundreds of thousands of times. They have done fatigue tests on, on this. So this really uh, filling a gap between uh, metals and, and polymers. Uh, so this is uh, very, uh, very uh, important. Uh, and also what is really uh, interesting is if you just change the composition a little bit so that you have a little bit of dislocation activity in the nickel titanium, right away the, the strain limit goes from 6% to 2%, okay? So I uh, just want to go a bit quickly. Uh, so this is uh, uh, in situ uh, synchrotron diffraction at uh, advanced photon source uh, at ARCMA National Lab. And we're looking at, uh, this is the body center cubic Naubian 2 to 0 peak. So that's uh, the nanowires, those are 10 milli nanowires. And these are the nitinol uh, B2 uh, peaks. So as we're straining the microwire in situ, you see the you see the diffraction peaks changing right in front of your eyes like that. I've never seen anything like that before. 10 million nanowires doing it in lockstep. Okay, and, and this is completely reversible. So uh, the trick uh, is that you need to actually match the so-called true elasticity of the nanowire. Now, if you just have a single nanowire, this is not surprising. Uh, people have done in situ TM where you have a single nanowire constraint it to 8%. But this is, you know, 10 million of these. And uh, the key is to match it with the phase transformation elasticity and to do this so-called pseudo elasticity, true elasticity matching. That if this is not a B2 to B19 prime phase transformation, if this is due to uh, dislocation plasticity, then no, you will lose uh, this 6%, you only get 2%. So uh, one question, you know, we ask is, you know, what can you do with this? And it turns out that this niobium based alloys uh, is uh, still uh, type one, you know, BCS superconductor is still standard superconductor, but it's the workhorse in uh, magnetic resonance, in tokamaks, in accelerators. So it is still very important to modify superconducting temperatures. And, Professor Li Shen, by drawing the wires with different process, he is able to lock in a residual stress uh, in the in the in the nanowire. And we have done modeling that shows that by different kind of uh, locking residual strain, you can change uh, the TC as well as the uh, critical magnetic field uh, in this uh, superconducting wire. And even though we didn't change very much, right? So from four point five. Kelvin to 5.2 Kelvin, just uh, uh, something like uh, 0.5 Kelvin. But remember, uh, these are cooled by liquid helium. So this actually significantly improve uh, the uh, engineering margin of, of these cables. So this is uh, another manifestation of, uh, you know, from first principle calculations and, and data science, you can actually lead to uh, better properties at the macro scale. So in the remaining uh, five minutes, uh, I'd like to just to say that uh, this word strain engineering also includes inelastic strain. And one very important inelastic strain is actually phase transformation. So we've done calculation, for example, this uh, uh, tungsten ditelluride, uh, it actually have this uh, one T prime phase and it can entertain this kind of very elastic uh, twin boundaries. And we predicted these twin boundaries are very glissal, they have low energy, and you can actually have this uh, ferro elasticity in this two, two dimensional material, as well as uh, ferro electric behavior. Uh, so, talking about this uh, you know, monolayer material, the standard one is like a hexagonal closed pack uh, material. It has uh, the mirror symmetry, but not uh, the uh, uh, inversion symmetry. But then the T phase uh, is like FCC, it has the inversion symmetry, but not the mirror symmetry. But we find that this T structure uh, in this paper is not a uh, stable structure. It actually always will do spontaneous, uh, this uh, pulse uh, distortion, uh, one by two distortion 
into one of the three uh, stream variants. Uh, and so this 1T prime uh, we found uh, is actually metastable. And in the case of Thomson dithelioride, it's actually more stable than the H structure. Okay, now what can this 1T prime phase do for you? Now, it turns out that uh, it can create this bending version, which is a topological feature. Uh, because generally uh, the transition metal uh, D orbitals would donate electrons to the uh, chalcogen P orbitals, right? The metal will lose charge, will lose the electron to the chalcogens. However, after this geometric uh, instability, after this uh, reconstruction, uh, in certain regions of the case space, there is a very big band inversion where you basically tie a knot uh, of your band structure. And, and, and that gives you it, it, it's, uh, this topological feature. But uh, when you don't strain the material, uh, there is this accidental metallicity. Okay, so uh, it is still an accidental metal. And you need actually a few percent, like we predicted for this 1T prime tungsten dithelioride out of all six uh, shown here is the most likely uh, uh, to have this effect. But you do need uh, like a few percent of parasitic strain to open up a, a, uh, a gap, uh, open up this accidental gap. So we basically predicted that uh, from first principle calculations that this is going to be a uh, <clears throat> quantum spin hole topological insulator. And so a few years later, uh, this took a little bit longer, I think three years, uh, uh, this was verified uh, from RPs. Indeed, there is a 45 uh, MeV uh, band inversion. Um, and also uh, people have measured that up to 100 Kelvin, uh, the edge conductance is a perfect nanowire. So E square over H, Landauer conductance. There is a magnetic signature. And furthermore, this only works for monolayers. If you put a bilayer, we've predicted you will lose this and they verify that. And, and even uh, more interesting, this actually uh, is also a superconductor. So uh, this could be used to, for uh, this Majorana fermions and for topological quantum computing, which is uh, much more uh, decoherent and resistant. So, um, after that work, we've uh, recently continued to look at you know, what other properties you can get. And one thing we noted is that with this uh, PD banding version, you got a lot bigger uh, wave function mixing. So for the topological insulators, and especially those uh, with this so-called Mexican hat uh, topology, uh, you're going to get a much, much bigger uh, infrared response. So we predicted for this uh, tin, tele, uh, tin selenide uh, that uh, between uh, strain-free and a strain, every, everything is pretty, pretty much the same, but you're going to get a huge uh, infrared absorption at uh, this 0.2 EV edge. So uh, this is a prediction uh, that's yet uh, to, be, to be verified. So this is a normal topological insulator. And we have a Mexican hat topological insulator. There is yet another amplification of, of this effect. So we predicted for these monochalcogenides, uh, you're actually going to get a factor of 10 bigger uh, gain or absorption uh, than the commercial uh, infrared detectors. So I just like to uh, summarize, and, and, and this is also, you know, from kind of a material genomic kind of a search. Uh, so, uh, you know, I explained that, you know, this can be very powerful in tuning all kinds of properties, but the question is, why haven't we seen uh, a lot of examples? And the reason is historical, uh, that it needs uh, four pillars. And these pillars weren't available until about you know, 30 years ago. Number one is you need to be able to make uh, structures and materials which can take a large dynamic range of shear and tensile stress and strain and hold it there at room temperature for a long time. And carbon nanotube was invented in 91, bulk nanocrystals mid 90s, graphene 2004. So before this, we simply don't have that many materials which can sustain, you know, 5% tensile strain for a year. But now we have, you know, 
a zoo of these materials, right? And the number two is uh, you've got to be able to apply force and stress on that material and, and measure the change in the photonic properties in the electronic conduction in a superconducting property right there at nanoscale. So AFM was 86, and then you have lab on the chips, MEMS, NEMS, and uh, you know these. Nowadays, we can really do these experiments right there on those materials, like Professor Yang Lu has shown. Number three is a little bit more subtle. Let's say that you want to have a 5% strain silicon uh, at let's say uh, 50 Celsius for three years, because three years is the lifetime of your cell phone. Uh, but you find, you know, after maybe five months, you check uh, your silicon, the, the, the stress is gone. And you want to know whether that, gone, that is gone by dislocation slip, you know, dislocation nucleation from the surface, or is it gone by fracture, or is it gone by diffusion or creep? You want to know the deformation mechanisms of this inelastic relaxation because the whole idea is to lock the system in that metastable state. So you're going to use things like in situ transmission electron microscopy, in situ synchrotron, you're going to use atomistic modeling to model these diffusion and displacive deformation mechanisms. Right? However, the, the pitch here is a little bit different from the traditional studies of physical metallurgy, because the goal is not to use this mechanism for forming or for lifing. Well, in some sense, for lifing. The goal is to defeat these mechanisms. The goal is to know what is the stress, temperature, time, material, envelope that you can take advantage of, of this uh, stress uh, strain. So the goal is to defeat, to see none of these a mechanism from, from happening uh, in, in your device. And, and lastly, uh, is this actually has to do with you know, the, the topic of this symposium, which is after all, we're no longer uh, in the stone age. Uh, we don't have just to do everything in this uh, trial and error approach. We have very high powered DFT calculations and the excited state calculation methods. So we can compute exactly what is our ideal strain surface. And if you go to you know seventy percent of the shear uh, ideal strain, you know how much benefit it can give you in your carrier mobility, in your superconductivity. And so all these can be computed. However, there is a big data problem. So uh, our work in sort of learning the band structure in uh, strain and strain gradient space, uh, I think, can be very powerful in telling us how to design devices and how to do. Uh, good experiments. So all these four, right? So this is a Nobel Prize that's like 20 years ago. This developed, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. So none of these four pillars were available until, uh, you know, three decades. And we already have commercial success. So strained silicon, strained semiconductor was first used in lasers and then later used, uh, <coughs> uh, developed by, uh, 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 professors at, at, at Stanford and MIT, and then later brought to commercial success in the mid 2000s. And now this is tens of billions of dollar industry. So I really am very optimistic on the long term prospects of uh, using elastic strain uh, to change uh, and, 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 and uh, design uh, new devices with unprecedented behavior. So with that, I'd like to finish and take questions.